Well, thanks, Blaise. It's, it's really good to have a, a session on this, this very important topic of, of education, because education feeds through to so many of the other questions that we're considering here at the, the Friedman Conference. Now, it was, it was interesting now chatting beforehand. We've got a session here that combines discussion of, of higher education and school education. Now, the policy issues are, are pretty different, in fact, and the regulatory issues are, are very different. Uh, school education, higher education in Australia are, are kind of the reverse of each other. We've got an unusually, by international standards, high level of you know, support and funding of private school education, but by international standards, a, a, a very, very um, public dominated um, higher education system. Uh, where, so it's a, a strain, the, the regulatory issues are quite different in both, but I'm hoping that there'll be some, uh, some common themes you know, through the, the three papers and the discussion. Now, I might just say something about this um, funny institution that no one seems to be able to pronounce the name of, um, Alpha Crucis. Um, it was the college of the Australian Pentecostal movement. There are now more Pentecostals in churches on a Sunday than Anglicans. So it's now moved to number two behind the, the Catholics in terms of um, religious participation. So there's a vision uh, maybe 10 years ago to um, for the Pentecostal College, which had been training you know, people for ministry in the Pentecostal movement, you know, to, to become a, a broad-based um, Christian research university for Australia and beyond. So I, I joined um, five years ago. I had good, um, good friends there. Um, I'd been in the university system before that. So it's been, it's been a really interesting um, ride the last five years. Now, we're now about 4,000 students from... Um, vet level up to, to PhD level, and probably applying for, for university accreditation you know, in the next uh, couple of years. And uh, Alpha Crucis too, the, the silly name, it, I, I said really rude things about it when I joined, but then discovered it was the name, um, the name came from the president's wife, and I was sort of discreetly told that I should um, keep my mouth shut about what a silly name it was. Asians can't say it at all, but we had to change the name from Southern Cross College, which was the name previously, because there's already a Southern Cross University and there can't, there can't be two of them. So hence the name, and Alpha Crucis is the brightest star in the Southern Cross constellation. So anyway, that's that. And uh, this is an issue that I hadn't thought much about before um, joining Alpha Crucis. Um, I think we, we do have a, 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 a higher education policy debate uh, that's dominated by a cartel of, of public universities. Now, working in a university, one, um, for those of you who are in universities or around them, you kind of think that public, in, in Australia anyway, that public universities are kind of the, the natural you know, way of doing things. We've all been, those of us who've had a higher education have been through a public university. We kind of imagine that private universities are you know, kind of Dickensian uh, things that exist on the fringes of the respectable enterprise that, that we're engaged in. And, and it's really hard, I think, for people who have been through the system, who you know, don't see anything else, and to start thinking about these issues of, you know, of competition in, in higher education. But then when you look, look a bit below the surface, as you know, I guess I was forced to do when I moved out of the, the public system to, to join Friends at Alpha Crucis, uh, what you do see then is a, a very well-resourced um, university lobby in Canberra. Um, they've got about as many people in Canberra as I have in my Faculty of Business, um, and they're on much better money, um, lobbying the government full-time. You look at any committee on higher education that, that's formed. Now, for instance, the, the committee, um, the Higher Education Standards Panel, that determines the rules for entry of new providers, the definition of university. Well, you know, guess who's on it? Well, all the, the experts, and the experts are all from um, public universities. So it's a bit like the, the situation uh, if you were trying to deregulate telecommunications and you decided that you know, really you had to have the experts there and so the committee to determine the rules for entry of new um, telecommunications providers will be determined by you know, a group of existing um, telecom executives. And you can imagine they'd be, you know, um, counselling, you know, caution and stringent requirements for new providers, et cetera, et cetera. 
So that sort of situation kind of is regarded as you know, just natural in the way it should be uh, in higher education. But what I want to do is to try and, you know, in the few minutes I've got, um, you know, open up a bit of uh, thinking about how it, it might be different. Now, the system we've got at the moment with uh, you know, the, the dominance of the public university lobby in higher education policy, um, there are honourable exceptions. I'm not sure that Andrew Norton's here or not. But Andrew, for many years, has written you know, some of the most sensible things about higher education. He's been a bit of a, a, lone, a lone voice. He's not completely alone, but you know, overwhelmingly it's a, a university-driven debate and a, a bit of a cosy arrangement between the bureaucrats, university managers and, and the unions as well. What does that give us? Well, it gives us a, a lack of diversity. Um, we've got a whole lot of public universities that kind of look the same. Um, you know, there's different levels of quality, but they're all trying to be the same sort of, of thing. They look you know, remarkably similar to each other. And I believe that that institutional you know, bureaucratic monoculture also contributes to the, you know, the intellectual monoculture that we've got. There's been a lot of discussion of the monoculture in the humanities in Australia. I think that's probably a little bit exaggerated sometimes. But the other dimension that receives less attention, I think, is, is innovation. Now, we complain constantly about the lack of innovation from our universities and lack of um, capacity to engage you know, with entrepreneurs, et cetera. And what would you expect from large you know, bureaucratic dinosaurs where you know, people's habits of, of thought and action you know, are formed in those sorts of institutions? So we get a lack of diversity, a lack of innovation. Uh, we have a, a lack of competitive neutrality between public and private providers. Um, for instance, um, although private provider students are now allowed um, access to the fee-help system, there's a 25% administrative loading on the fee-help debts of um, private college students. And private college students, of course, don't get any government, or their institutions don't get any government funding directly for the degrees. Um, at PhD level, for instance, I was PhD program director at Alpha Crucis until uh, handing it over to someone else this year. Uh, we have built a, a pretty strong PhD program. A lot of people have actually walked away from scholarships at, at public universities to come and, and do PhDs with us. But there's about, it's a complex formula, around about $50,000 of government funding for a completed PhD in Australia. So we get, we get zero. That gives you an idea of the sorts of you know, competitive neutrality issues that there are in this area. Uh, you can appreciate that if we're pulling students away from you know, at undergraduate level, you know, at PhD level, from governed universities with that sort of funding disadvantage, you know, it's, it's going to blood everywhere if private providers are actually allowed you know, access to funding. Um, on a, on, and the other things on anything like an equitable basis. In a system like we've got, there's a large degree of rent seeking. Uh, the incentives in the system are not, uh, you know, are strong to be you know, lobbying the government um, to be engaging in all sorts of unproductive rent seeking behaviour. Now, rather than doing the sorts of things which are going to be improving uh, research, teaching, uh, giving us value for the, the taxpayer dollar that's invested in higher education. And uh, the rents are you know, partly seen in salaries. You know, the corridor's full of bureaucrats that you, uh, well-paid bureaucrats with you know, entourages. Now, if you walk through any um, public university, just look at the ads in the higher education section of The Australian. Um, or the, the conversations um, job ad section. Uh, if you, there's endless jobs for well remunerated, uh, sometimes vague um, senior administrative positions in universities, um, much more common than, than real, real teaching and research jobs, unfortunately. So now what can be done uh, briefly about that situation? You know, I think the, the most important uh, thing that issue at the moment in higher education policy is facilitating the entry of newer universities. That includes exit of existing providers. Um, I wrote a thing um, last year in the Fin Review about trying to restructure public universities so that there is actually a possibility of them going broke or there is a possibility of a new management 
you know, taking over you know, a failed um, public university. So facilitating exit is a good idea, facilitating the entry of new universities. At the moment, there's a thing called the Higher Education Standards Panel, which is inquiring into the requirements for new universities. Currently, uh, we've got us and a couple of other private providers have got to um, self-accrediting higher education institution status. So that means we've, as far as tech, so the regulator is concerned, we've ticked all the boxes to become a university, but then um, actually to take the next step and get the university name, which is controlled. So in Australia, you can't call yourself a university unless you've you know, been through all the, the official hoops. In America, you can start a university basically in a garage. So that's kind of, that's not too good if we're trying to compete in an international student market against them. Um, but at the moment, um, this uh, panel, which was incidentally um, full of, uh, stacked with mostly very senior people in the universities, mostly university vice-chancellors, set up a set of rules where prospective um, universities had to be, become a university college. And then that was a five-year probation process after becoming university college to become a university. Now, if you look closely at the university college rules, it's designed to be a swamp through which no private provider has any hope of progressing. So you know, I think though there's currently an inquiry into those standards and the outcome of that inquiry, you know, particularly eliminating the category of university college and you know, simplifying the rules, not, not watering down quality by any means, but simplifying the bureaucratic requirements for um, becoming a, a university. And then I think you know, that's, that is the, the big issue. Smaller issues are doing something about this iniquitously anti-competitive 25% loading on the, the debts of private provider students. Um, either getting rid of it or extending it to all university students. It would be the same from a competitive neutrality point of view. And I think also connected with that, opening up domestic degree funding to all TEXA approved providers. Under the logic of the demand driven system that we've got at the moment, now, funding should flow to all accredited providers. Now, I haven't met anyone in the universities, despite them being full of brilliant people, who could explain you know, why that is not currently the situation. And also opening up competitive research funding to private providers. The universities have fought hard to stop private providers like us even applying for Australian Research Council grants. Even though the um, quality of the research infrastructure, the research environment, is an increasingly large part of the ARC assessment criteria. So it's much better handled that way than a blanket exclusion of private providers from the ARC system. We could also talk about unionisation. You know, something that would be particularly evil that could happen would be under a Labor government tying university accreditation to having an enterprise agreement with the NTEU. So now we're evil because we're not just Christian, even Pentecostal Christian, we're private and we're also non-unionised. So some of the, the worst things that could happen you know, under a Labor government include you know, forcing us and other private providers to, to unionise. So I'll stop there and we can, you know, hopefully there'll be some connection between some of the themes uh, in the three presentations and we can continue the discussion later. Thank you, Paul. Our next speaker is Emily Kuzef. Um, Emily is a high school teacher with an undergraduate degree from Monash University with a focus on international relations. So she moved to Russia early last year after receiving a scholarship to study a Master of Corporate Finance uh, there in Moscow. And prior to that, she was an active participant in the Liberty Movement in Australia. And um, as a former teacher myself, I think it's really good to have a teacher on the panel because I suppose it, Education policy, as with most things, from, an, from the outside it looks so simple and straightforward and then as soon as you get into a classroom with 25 screaming kids it becomes a bit harder. So um, it's really good to have Emily here to, today to talk to us a bit more of a practical perspective on, on school education. So please welcome Emily. Okay, well just to begin, I actually haven't prepared any presentation today. I know that's crazy, but I've always been a little bit crazy. Um, the main thing that I would like to um, just 
begin with is that my ideas are still developing and I think that's very important for young people, ex even for older people, which I believe after a certain age, they become very um, solid in what they believe. They you know, have their certain place in life and then they just stop challenging themselves. And then they go and create all these policies and believe that children and, and university students will care, which is they don't care, basically. So when I did teaching, um, it wasn't something I originally planned to do. It was an accident because I graduated from Monash and then I went to Europe and did some internships in anti-human trafficking, um, uh, orphanage in Romania and NGO development in Berlin. And then once I finished that, I thought and development isn't for me at all. Uh, so I came back to Australia and I thought, well, you know, stuff this, I'm going to begin a business. But then I thought, well, at this point in time, I still want to learn, you know, and I don't think universities even offer us really the possibility to ask questions, which is what I said to Monash University when I finished. Basically, I said, um, there was a you know, questionnaire, what do you believe Monash University can do differently? And I said, really allow students to study and ask questions, and you'll be surprised just how much the youth of Australia can really do. But I found after travelling and doing things, um, yeah, no one really cares about that sort of thing. It's all about theories. So getting back to the topic of um, directly high school and education, um, I would say that uh, theory is all great and well, and then there's something that will continually disrupt your theories. It's very objective and it's called reality. So um, my, my experience actually working in education is very different from what we t learn as a like a dip ed or a masters of education and if you ask teachers uh, I'll say you know what did you learn from the degree uh, that then can actually uh, like apply practically to students and they say nothing I was just gonna match I'll burn all that information and who directs this who creates this people who are not directly involved in the teaching of children and you can see this you know not um, by working with them so that's why uh, yeah, I think it's important, Blaze also said, you need people directly engaged in the process of teaching to actually consider what students should be learning. And the other thing is, I didn't just go to Russia because um, I got a master's degree. I was trying to escape from education, and not just from education. Education was the thing that woke me up the most to what's happening in Australia and to the issues of liberty within this country. Um, for example, I had a very rough awakening in a small rural school, uh, very difficult kids. Um, you know, once on um, duty, there was this little year three student. I'm mainly in high school, but I have taught primary and been interacting with them. And he punched another student in the face. And I said, oh, would your daddy do this? He said, probably. So, you know, the, this very difficult school. Um, so what I would um, like to say as well is, um, well, I could say many things, but I'm a bit nervous. I'm not actually prepared at this moment to actually give you a really solid, this is what needs to happen. It's more, yeah, again, developing sort of ideas. So education is very important. We can admit to this, right? But it's not just that to point out that it's important, but how should we administer education? Do you believe from the past experiences that the state and people bureaucratically not involved directly in the process of educating should have a say in what students should learn at all. Because I see it day in and day out, you go to these kids that you give them a sheet of paper and they give you the finger back. Sometimes literally they'll give you the finger back. And you know, what is the point for me? It's not just about teaching students to write a great essay. It's what you can, the student can fill that essay with. And I think if we really allow students to really just develop individually, you can be, you'll be surprised what they can do. But they're not allowed, so obviously you have them rebelling at the high school and university ends. I mean, this cry for socialism is a symptom of something else. You know, people are trying to find meaning in their lives that they don't get from the curriculum, which is a dead curriculum. Great theories, ideas, but I found if you get history and you relate it to contemporary era and you relate it to experiences of the world, students will sit there like, finally interested, even students that generally aren't interested in things. So how should we administer education? The other thing is, that's the major question, should the state be involved? The other thing is, um, um, sorry, I'm looking, I just lost my eye, sorry. Oh gosh, I just left my phone, sorry. Um, okay, so, what, for those who have children, you would know 
that to take, I don't personally have children, but I work with them, that you need to take an individual approach to every single child that's there in front of you, your children, right? They develop individually. You can guide them, um, you can try and control them, but what are they gonna say to you? Well, depending on the personality of the child, but I hitchhiked South America when I was 19 by myself, and well, not just hitchhiking, I was just traveling, and I stayed with local people, and my dad didn't stop me. To be honest, I don't think he could have, but he did buy me ransom insurance, and I didn't know this. So some nights that he was awake, oh, my daughter could be killed, and um, he didn't stop me from doing it. I think, you know, I appreciate my parents not intervening. But we develop individually without any strict guidelines. And this is your individual children, let alone all the children of the Australian society. So there's a big um, dissociation between the theory and the reality of actually working with children. Now, to go back to things that I've heard already in this conference, like in marketing, don't appeal to the head. The head will get you nowhere to the intellect. Unless you really love thinking, intellectualizing, that might appeal to you. But most humanity, people in the streets, they don't care about our theories. They care about how they relate in a sense that they already have this inner uh, impulse to then consider your ideas in the first place. Appeal to the heart. The curriculum does not appeal to the hearts of children. That is a major issue. It is a dead curriculum. And um, somebody uh, said before that um, the old bureaucratic structure um, is, you know, it's an old bureaucratic structure. The whole state considered administration is an old bureaucratic st structure. We need new ideas. And where will we get these new ideas unless we let children be children, university students be university students? I was constantly in conflict with my lecturers and things because they were giving me theories, talking about Argentina, they haven't even been to Argentina. I was just like, how are we supposed to learn about the world without actually going into the world? So I did, that's why I hitchhiked South America because I was studying international relations and I went and I stayed with local people that, yeah, as I said, I'm a slightly bit crazy, um, but it taught me a lot more than my degree taught me. And I started at UNSW, finished at Monash with one and a half year in Spain. So it was more the experience of where I was studying that I learned the most through life experience than just writing a paper on uh, the modern history of Spain or something like this. That I could pick up a book and read, sort of thing. So how do we get the content related to the inner life of the child? Well, first we've got to consider the inner life of the child. Children do not care. You can do more funding. You can write great theories, and they will give you the finger. And that's what they're doing to us. And every time, and then there's the symptoms of this. We ask, like I was at Mon um, in Moscow uh, doing the Master of Corporate Finance degree, and oh, it was killing me. Also because I'm more of a human person, but this is how I felt going through university. Like, if you want to combat the war and you know, stop children taking drugs, shut down all universities. Okay, because I wanted to go out and snort some cocaine after that lecture that I was in, microeconomics. You know, and also it's a very mathematical approach to the world as well, which I don't think encompasses the realities of human beings. The person next to you, write a mathematical structure about him or her and see how far that gets you when it actually applies to the person there. So this is, I would say, another thing, humanise education. Now, um, there's, as I said, developing ideas, and I could talk on various things, I'm more... So I'm just going to give you some examples of, uh, of things that I've seen again happening. So there was a year eight student and she was a terrible student. I was teaching maths over this time. And I went up to her and I said, what have you done in 45 minutes? Like she did nothing. She looks at me, she frowns and she stands up and walks out of the classroom. She has something we give students now called the time out card. If they can't handle life, they just walk out of the classroom. Because the principal and the student teachers cannot handle these kids. There's too much regulation, too much politicization. So what's she going to do when she enters um, life? Another time, the same student, she was an eager... I don't necessarily hate, I don't hate anybody, but it can, she was a nasty student. And um, I said, again, what have you done? And she goes, you know what, I've got depression, you know, blah, blah, blah. And I said, well, I might have depression. The teachers here might have depression. They have to turn up to work. The reality, but you actually shouldn't say that to a student because it can hurt their feelings. You know, another boy, oh, what do you want to do with your life? Nothing. Uh, nothing, you have no interests? Not. And then um, I said, well, that's easy. Just find a bridge, get a sleeping bag, and you're set for life. 
Oh, you can't tell me that. I can, but I shouldn't. You, but <laughs> we're balancing as teachers on, on getting in trouble. And one, um, Mr. Lestrange just came to me before this and told me that he wrote um, as a teacher, he was a teacher, to above, uh, somewhere in um, higher level, and he was dismissed from a teaching position sort of thing. You know, and this, my mum also, she worked, she's more like a, plays golf and goes on cruises, but she did sometimes work um, in teaching and for fun sort of thing. And what she worked at this really difficult school was an art teacher. And half the class didn't hand in anything, year 11 students. And she said to them, if you don't hand it in, I'm going to fail you. And um, they're like, no, nah, we're going to pass, miss. Don't worry, we'll pass. And she's like, I'm going to fail you. So she failed them. The school passed them. She went in conflict with them. I'm not, I'm not changing the marks. And she basically got a warning. You know, this is fun in here. So the students pass, and the next um, semester or whatever, they would go past. I told you it would pass, and they did nothing. We can't fail them. Teachers have to like do a whole thing of this student did this, and then it comes down to emotional problems of the part of the child and things like this. The harder you work, the more you, instead of asking for money in this country, the harder you work to get it, even in the progressive tax rate that we have here, the less you actually receive back. So the fifth day working as a teacher, I might as well not work. It's within a progressive tax rate. I work for like 60 bucks on that day. Why turn up to work? The harder we work, the less we get, unless you can do terrific, you get a great accountant, which I think is very necessary, and, um, and, and bypass all that sort of stuff. So um, just on Tuesday, again, it's a huge pol politicization of the curriculum. We teach everything that's on the news at school, transgenderism, um, climate change, all the major political issues. So just on Tuesday, there was these um, group of like um, stu girl students, and they were doing our role models. And half of them, their role model was a transgender or lesbian. My role model never would have been that. I'm not saying you can't be that. To be what you want. But why are we teaching it at school to the point where 50% of these girls, and it was a good school, are, are telling us that a transgender is their role model because they stand for equality. The other thing is that they talk about equality and diversity in schools, which are two conflicting terms in my opinion. Equality and diversity. We talk about diversity, or diversity of the student, and we don't do anything. We force these boys, particularly, um, into this solid framework, and they can't even stay in their chairs. And I, I've actually only been back for two um, months from Russia, and um, I've changed my perspective a bit. Instead of trying to force these kids to work, I see what we're teaching them, this like stupid worksheet for the student that needs more of a human interaction just to inspire them to you know, get off their butt and actually have an interest in the world. And um, I don't see the point of even trying to force this on the kids in the first place, sort of thing. So um, kids, a lot of them hate school. That there's them saying something. And we've got to listen to that. A lot of people hate university. Why are young people dropping out of university courses, you know, con like continually lost? What will I do with my life? If you're lucky enough to have an intellectual uh, opinion that, that you can then have an inner enthusiasm for and go through life doing that, you're very lucky because lots of people aren't like that. But here in this room we have motivated individuals. Majority aren't like that. So we're very lucky, you could say, in a sense to have that motivation from our families, or inner life, whatever. But the thing is, we appeal yeah, to the head, but the heart is forgotten. We're here because of some feeling that then comes up as a conception of something. You've got to appeal to the heart of the children, and you can do that. But to do that, we need the state to have no control over educational. I would say nobody, uh, anybody not directly involved in the teaching of those students should not have a say in what the, that, the particular group of students, ethnic group, religious group, should, should be learning about. And then you can in, create more um, healthy social communities when people are allowed to interact freely with one another. You can yell, moral, be moral, be moral, and people will give you the finger. Sorry for actually giving you the finger there. But it's like an inner feeling you can sense from the kids, from the young people, from the university students. And then we grow into, uh, you know, people who uh, haven't really had the chance to just develop when they were young. Anyway, that's what I'll leave it at. Thank you for uh, listening to my impromptu speech. And um, on to the next person. Thank you.
Thank you very much for that, Emily. I think it's a very impassioned speech. Thanks for that. Um, our next speaker, Do Dr Joanna Barr, has a long-standing interest in the brain and how it learns. So she has a PhD in neuroscience from the University of Washington in the US. And to meet a growing population of self-motivated and unique learners, Joanna is currently working on a digital platform to connect passionate students and instructors within a local community. Um, and today she's talking specifically about homeschooling as an alternative to the, the traditional schooling model. So please welcome Joanna. Well, it's actually after hearing the, um, the two talks, um, it's gonna work. Um, I think there actually is quite a lot of overlap with the, um, some of the problems that we're finding in school with motivating children. But then also looking at the paperwork and the influence of the state in kind of stopping um, education evolving in the 21st century. So um, it's, it's a nice panel to be part of. So I'll just wait till this gets into presentation. I'll just keep going. OK. All right. So there's a, um, anyway. So it was in the 18th century when child labour was acceptable and children were believed to be innately sinful that schools started. And it was churches that created the schools and they ran them. And then it was about in the 19th, uh, in the 19th century that states took over this role and school was made compulsory and the number of school hours, days, weeks and years was extended. Now, since then, not much has changed in terms of the structure or the social hierarchy within a school. But there has been social changes. Uh, feedback has resulted in punishment no longer being, dis uh, being um, physical. We've got smaller class sizes. We have teachers' aides, etc. And in the last few years in New South Wales, there's been the introduction of the standard curriculum and NAPLAN testing. Now, not all of these changes are as effective as origin promoters originally wanted, but they do demonstrate good intentions. Australian youth are valued, and schools can adapt. But most importantly, what these continuous changes remind us of is that the school system is not ideal, and it never has been. It is a pre-industrial um, institution, and it is an ongoing experiment. But, but it is not the only educational experiment underway. And... Okay, so my slides not, aren't going to work, so we'll have to, that's all right. Can we go to the, okay. There are, thankfully to our healthy democracy, we do have other choices of a non-traditional educational styles. And for this talk, I'm going to be focusing on home education. So home education is the oldest and most continuous educational style. And this year, the Australian Bureau of Statistics um, reported that there were 20,000 um, registered home, home educated students. Now, due to well-known non-compliance in this community, we actually um, expect that that number is double. And this is, so that, make, that, that makes home educated students 1% students of the student population. And this is consistent with um, North America, New Zealand and the UK. Now, what's interesting is that about 10 years ago, it was, it was less than half. So, why has the population doubled over the last 10 years, approximately? And for the rest of my talk, that's what I would like to focus on. The, um, um, what is motivating this trend? What businesses and services are catering to this market? And what challenges lie ahead? So what is motivating parents to take on this Herculean task? It's a total lifestyle change and a substantial financial commitment to pay for resources and services. And it's all on one income. So it is not a decision made lightly, as home education is an enormous practical and theoretical commitment. Studies show it is not due to a stereotype. Home educators, oh, we can go forward, thank you. Home educators come from all walks of life, every corner of the country, from ver with variable income, um, incomes, uh, cultural backgrounds, and uh, training levels, and there are many teachers involved in home education. So here is a survey result of reported reasons why people homeschool. So it's a small percent, this is, this is only registered students, so it's not completely accurate, but it's for registered students last year. 
So a small per portion is for bullying. Another is for religious, uh, seven, about 7% for religious reasons. About 20% for special learning needs. So this group we often refer to as unintentional home educators. And it's usually that the, school, the pace of school is too fast, slow, or stressful for the child. But at home, the parents can create a personalised learning environment. And they can ensure that talent and potential talent is not going to be held back or overlooked. About 26% say philosophical reasons. And so just broadly speaking, this can be government and concerns about homogenisation, indoctrination and conditioning. Um, it could be about teaching, the style of teaching in schools. So authorities, rules, testings, expectations, they do not align with parents' ideas of um, sharing and learning um, knowledge and about, um, and about learning about uh, emotional intelligence. And then there's the family aspect of it, um, whereby school, the school and homework are time demanding, they're exhausting, and they can interfere with family life. And parents would prefer to have a more democratic relationship with their child, with minus the pressure, uh, external pressures and scheduling of school. So another 25% um, answered other. And so this could, recruit, uh, this could include people who are working remotely, parents who are working remotely, the high cost of private education, and children engaged in elite sports and music. And then, classic for the home education, 20% decided not to respond. So when you speak to home educators, you find that their reasons are usually multifaceted, thoughtful, and well-informed. So we'll go forward. Um, this is the digital age. Oh, thank you, it's working. Oh, great. This is the digital age. And it's changing social environments, and it's also influencing parenting and education. And so, one th so parents are reading the papers, they're seeing the headlines, and more than ever, they're reading evidence-based research. Scientific communication has improved and is now available across many mediums. So in turn, parents' expectations of an educational experience have changed. And the schools are getting the feedback, but they are not reacting fast enough. And home education is just so easy these days. You know, it is trivial to find a local home educating community online and quickly glean that the community is big, welcoming, and busy, and discover there are a wide array of services and people to facilitate the home education journey. So now we'll look at some of the potential opportunities here. So homeschoolers use a wide variety of local services they purchase goods from near and far, and they use, utilize many online materials. So for local services, the, uh, the home and the home educations is really a misnomer, because for home educated students, their campus has no boundaries and no strict schedules. Home educated students use tutors, they, can, they participate in short and long courses, they go on excursions, they do apprenticeships, and they utilise local facilities. And from a business perspective, you know, here are a group of potential very loyal customers. So how does a, how does a business advertise to this very niche market? So initially what would happen would be an, a home educator would probably directly approach a business with a proposal and things would roll on from there. Thus the more, um, the more established a home education community is, the more business arrangements there are. For example, so a gymnasium and a swimming pool is quite happy to offer um, lessons to a group of home educated students in off-peak hours. Now, discount rates help but a quality service must be delivered to maintain business. So home educators, they talk a lot. They talk face-to-face -face at meeting at, at meetups meet and then online. And when they're looking into a service or when they're wanting to find a service or before they even sign up for a service, they will, they will, they will consult with their communities for advice, recommendations and reviews. So it is for a business to be involved and it is, it is important for any business that wants to work with these people to be involved and to have an impressive service to deliver. So the other, one moment. Oh, and another service over here, 
are consultants. So parents may seek guidance initially to help navigate the home education landscape and to set up their um, living space. An optimal learning environment is a, is a priority for home educators. So just entering a home educator's uh, home, you can see that it is set up to facilitate learning with desks, stationery, and bookshelves often prominent and a TV absent. So in many cases, actually now, and this is very much so in America, parents are buying homes and modifying them or building them from scratch so that every room is a classroom from math to music. So when it comes now to purchasing products, so say it be an educational resource, equipment, a book, home educators will again consult their local communities, but then they will cast their research net wider to the national and international home education communities and to the World Wide Web, getting reviews from Facebook forums, book review sites, Pinterest, uh, the, usual, the usual players. Now, they're not spontaneous shoppers. They have time to think and to make purposeful um, purchases. They ask lots of questions with specific inquiries into the content, dialogue, art, and figures portrayed in, in a product and what, the materi and what materials it's actually made of. Businesses describe them, and you can't read that here, um, as out-of-the-box thinkers that are willing to experiment and buy products not because of a label or brand name, but because the product is of high quality and will stimulate creativity or is specific to fostering a child's developmental milestone. So for businesses trying to sell these types of products, getting a recommendation on a popular home education blog, YouTube channel, or podcast is key. And the bottom line being that home educators are great, greatly influenced by recommendations from other home educators. So a particularly big and flourishing business is selling curriculums or providing distance educations, uh, distance learning. New curricular packages and supplementary materials are being created by, created by talented and experienced people. So remember, in the traditional schools in New South Wales, they use one standard curriculum. In the home education world, there are, there are, more, there are dozens to choose from, dozens and dozens. Families may use one style or different curriculums for each child and any time change. Plus, curriculums are exported to other home educating countries, to expats and to adventurers, families on extended holidays. So this rich breeding ground of curriculums sorts itself out through competition with the cream curriculums rising, the cream curriculum selling best. And to anyone that is interested in developing education, this is a gold mine of research material that is being developed independent of people's taxes. So then there are the online <coughs> materials. So YouTubers, podcasters, bloggers, and educational websites seek to get the home education community regularly accessing and using their sites. For example, piano lessons, reading eggs, and science classes, to name a few. You know, there's a lot of interesting material and personalities in this space, and so I'm only going to briefly introduce just three. So there's the School of Life YouTube channel, and this material, material will give anyone a head start in relationships, emotional intelligence, philosophy and reason. Then there's Coursera. Coursera. It's built out of Stanford. It has up to 3,000 courses, um, all from Ivy League universities. So about 20 years ago, 0.1% of the population would have been able to see a lecture out of MIT or Harvard. And today, you are now able to go and enrol in classes from these universities. And they have the added bonus that for a small fee, once you successfully complete the course, you can have it linked, you can have it listed on your LinkedIn account um, with all your other degrees and education. Um, and then finally, Khan Academy. So Khan, that this is Bill Gates's favorite teacher. And this course, this has incredible tutorials with using text and video. So these sites are valuable resources to any student looking for in an introduction into a subject up to advanced studies. And completing courses on these sites, like especially Coursera, speaks volumes about an individual's self-motivation and autodidactic abilities. So the success of these three sites in particular are worth noting. You know, there's talent and money behind them, but on a practical level, the lecture videos are no longer than 30 minutes to avoid lecture fatigue. You know, universities still have 50 minute lectures and classes are still 45 minutes despite lecture fatigue being described. 
for years, for decades. The lecture videos are no longer, um, the students can pause, rewind and play the videos. Parents are highly recommended to use these sites for personal studies, as what we do speaks, um, speaks louder than what we say. Um, there is, in the case of Coursera and Khan Academy, there is no distracting advertising, and they are both very user-friendly for children. Now, there is plenty more room for sites like this, and especially on the horizon, we're going to see platforms for artificial intelligence, but that's, that's not happening just yet. So being compelled to learn can be hard, and these services allow for a curated and curiosity-driven education. A resource-rich education used to be a privilege exclusive to the very rich. By contrast today, every Australian is encouraged and supported to spend the first 20 to 25 years of their life learning. Australia's stability and standard of living basically means any family, if they are motivated, can have a life rich in philosophy, knowledge and meaning. Home education is an avenue for families who want this. Now, what challenges lie ahead? So homeschooling has been illegal in Germany since Hitler outlawed it in 1938, and it is illegal in many countries still around the world. So here in Australia, it is legal, and participants are required to register and follow the rules of the state or territory that they live in. The rules require differing amounts of record keeping, lesson planning, and depending on what state or territory you're in, regular visits from a government representative. But as I mentioned earlier, more than half of the home educators are not registering. So some of you might ask, well, why not? And then others will ask, well, why should they? So New South Wales law states parents are primarily responsible for their child's, um, for their child's education. Now, I, just due to time, I can only say the following about this. State-to-state -state comparisons reveal that low registration rates are due to poor regulatory design. So there are models in Tasmania, Canada, and New Zealand that show the simpler you make the, make the registering process and the more acceptance and support, the more, the more home educators will register. And the government has all of this information that was produced in the Home Education Association submission. It has been clearly shown that burdening parents with unjustified paperwork, intimidating tactics, and unclear rules discourages registration, especially when the laws lack perceived legitimacy. You know, there is no evidence suggesting home educators are not otherwise law-abiding citizens, and no evidence for concerns for home educated students during or post-home education. Home educated students have been found to exhibit high levels of well-being and self-esteem and suffer no impediment to work or further study. Actually, in many cases, home educated students start higher education earlier as they earn good to well above average grades. So whenever discussing education, perspective helps. Remember, in the traditional school model did not come about because it was an optimal solution. Traditional schools home education and alternative school models are important competitive players in Australia's evolving educational experiment and all modes of education should be supported efficiently. This is especially so when you consider that in a given year there are 8,760 hours. So assuming eight hours of sleep and an average school year, a child spends 1,080 hours in school. So politicians and parents in that 1,080 hours, lessons are broken up by breaks, queuing, waiting, assemblies, etc. Take it easy on the teachers and be realistic. A traditional school can only achieve, achieve so much, regardless of how much you invest in it. Parents, children are in your care more than 50% of the time. All parents are home educating. The future quality of life and academic success of Australia's youth does not so much depend on the type of schooling they're receiving, but on the habits they're picking up and how their educational experience influences and inspires the child to use the other 4,760 waking hours. And I'll end it there. Thank you.